Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Good morning, Grace. My name is My name is Peter Dedetinas. Uh, I'll be doing the Bible reading this morning. James 2, 1 through 7. The sin of partiality. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man and not the rich ones who have oppressed you and the ones who drag you into court. Are they not the ones who blasphemy the honorable name by which you were called? This is the word of God. You may be seated. Thank you, Dad. That's my dad. <laughs> Did you hear how he said the last name? I still can't say it. I'm 30 years old. I can't say the last name. But that's my dad, sweet beard. He's definitely a Jedi master. And uh, it's good to be a son. So <laughs> thanks, Dad. Good morning, Grace. <clears throat> how are you guys doing this morning? Busy, busy week in our country, was it not? I am, I want to begin by saying I am filled with joy, joy over what we've seen in our government uh, this week. So thankful for what God has accomplished in his sovereignty. I'm so thankful, so thankful that so many babies will live. I'm so thankful that God in his sovereignty made this happen. I praise God for that. And Grace family, our job is not done. It must continue, right? I, I like, to, like to say I'm not just uh, pro-life in the womb, but I'm pro-life till the tomb, right? And so we have to continue to care for moms. We have to continue to support them and help them financially, especially the single mother. We need to be a people who encourage dads to be dads, to care for their home. To, to, to uphold the family. We need to be a people who support the Pregnancy Resource Center, the foster care system, the, the adoptions. We need to be a people who make this a priority. The pulpits need to continue to thunder that every life matters, especially the ones who have no voice. And so this morning I praise God. You know, I'm also, uh, part of me is uh, filled with sorrow as I go through my Facebook and I see people um, feeling this hatred towards Jesus. And my heart is sad because I want them to know Jesus. I want them to love Jesus. I, want, I have this burden uh, for the lost. And I pray that you do uh, as well. There are so many people who reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we have the hope. I'm not satisfied that there are people going to hell. And neither should you. Our church has to be a church who cares about the lost and proclaims the gospel. And so let's be filled with joy and amazement that our God and his sovereignty did what only he can do. And let's be a people who proclaim the gospel to the lost and who are actively, actively helping with finding solutions in our country. Amen, Grace family. Please pray for your elders, your pastor elders, uh, that we would be diligent in coming together and thinking about, okay, how can we be creative as a church to be pro-life, uh, not just in the womb, but also all the way to till the tomb. Amen. You know, I'm blown away by God's sovereignty, how good he is. I'm blown away by his character. Are you ever blown away by the character of God? Are you ever amazed by who God is and how he works? If I were to ask you, what is the character of God? What would first come to your mind? Well, maybe some of you would think about God's holiness. Maybe some of you would think about God's sovereignty, his justice. Maybe others of you would think about his perfect love, his perfect mercy, his perfect grace. Maybe some of you would think about his faithfulness and even his goodness. 
But I wonder how many of us would think about how God is impartial, the impartiality of God, that this is one of his good characteristics, that God is a God who does not play favorites. He does not show favoritism. You know, Grace family, I think that God being impartial is one of the most forgotten characteristics of God. We don't think about it often. We don't thank him for this often. We don't praise him for this often. But Grace family, did you know that if you were to approach the throne room of God, you would not find a God sitting on the throne who plays favorites. God does not deal with people differently based on what they look like. He's not swayed or influenced by what we have, how much money we have. The kind of car we drive does not impress God. And I want to be clear, the amount of money you have, the power you have, the influence you have, Even the kind of family you're born into does not make you closer to God. It does not earn you special favor or special treatment with God. And it certainly does not give you a free ticket into heaven. You know, both the CEO and the cashier working at McDonald's are given common grace by God. They are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Both the millionaire and the homeless man receive common grace from God every single day. It doesn't matter who they are. And they are also saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter if you're lower class, middle class, upper class. It doesn't matter what skin color you have. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. Listen to me. God does not play favorites. He's impartial. All people are sinful. All people are saved by grace through faith alone. And that is good news. You know, it's not often that we think about how God is impartial. It's not often how we, it's not often that we think about that God does not play favorites. Favorites and and I think this this might be a serious problem if we're not careful. Here's why. You see, anytime, anytime the local church forgets about a specific attribute of God, that local church is in danger of backsliding into worldliness. I want to say that one more time. I want you to think about that. <clears throat> anytime the local church forgets about a specific attribute of God. That local church is in danger of backsliding into worldliness. That means that if Grace Bible Church forgets that God is impartial, then Grace Bible Church will be in danger of playing favorites and being clicky and only keeping to people who we think are valuable. And so this morning, James, like he has been doing every single week as we go through this book, has a really convicting message. And if you can't say amen, say ouch as we're going through this, all right? So this morning, I hope to accomplish three things through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, point number one is the command. Now, point number two is the reason. And point number three is the application. The command, James is going to give us the reason why we're given this command and the application. How do we apply this in our congregation? Let's pray. God, I'm blown away by your sovereignty. I'm blown away by your goodness and by your mercy, your holiness. But God, this morning, I pray that you'd help us to camp out on your impartiality. I pray you'd help us to think about how you had every reason to play favorites, and yet you didn't. You had every reason, every right to allow us to be close to you based on what you have seen in us, seen us on the outside, and yet you did not. You have given us grace. And God, I pray that you would help us to have joy in your character and in who you are today. Convict us with this word, Lord. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, point number one is the command. The command. James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers, 
to show no partiality, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And so James uses a word here. He's continued to use it. He uses it about 15 times throughout the book of James. Uh, He says, my brothers or my beloved brothers. He's also addressing the sisters as well within his congregation. But he says, my brothers. He's doing this because he loves his congregation. He doesn't want them just to know what he's saying in their minds. He wants them to believe it in their hearts. He wants them to be transformed by the word of truth that God used in their salvation. And he wants that word of truth to continue to transform them with this word. And so James tenderly, gently, and yet firmly, I think, gives the command to not show partiality as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he uses the word partiality here. I, I've, I've used that interchangeably with the word favoritism uh, so far, but I want to explain what this uh, word means. <clears throat> it comes from the Greek word uh, prosopolemsia, prosopolemsia. Uh, sorry, Dad, I know I butchered that word. Prosopolemsia, uh, that means to lift the face, to lift face. And what it mean, What he's saying is this, it's, it's to look at someone and it's to make judgment about uh, someone based on what we see. We judge them at face value. It means we treat someone better or worse because of what we see on the outside. How much coin they have in their pocket, what they believe, what their social status is. We maybe give someone more respect and maybe someone less respect. Someone special treatment, someone not so much special treatment. And so really it's this uh, this, uh, superficial type of judgment that doesn't take into consideration uh, what a person's done and what their character looks like. It judges everybody by what they see. And so in its most basic form, this word means favoritism, to play favorites. Now, I'm sure many of you here have suffered and experienced the pain of favoritism, right? I'm sure growing up, you've experienced favoritism when you were young, maybe in gym class, uh, when there was two captains picking teams, and uh, you quickly realized you're not going to get picked, or you're not going to get picked until the end because you're not one of the friends. I'm sure some of you have experienced pain, Um, being not the favorite child, right, in your family. Maybe your sister's the favorite child. Maybe your brother, your little brother, can do no wrong. You know, I I was thinking about calling my siblings up this week and being like, hey, what's it like not being the favorite child, you know? (laughs) But I decided not to. I figured I'd be gracious towards them. But you know what I'm saying. There's pain in that, right, not being the favorite child. Uh, My dad and I were talking about this sermon because he read the scripture, and so uh, we were talking about the text together this week, and uh, he gave me a beautiful illustration. My dad owns a restaurant called Subdoc on Jefferson Street. It is the best restaurant in Joliet. Actually, it's the best restaurant in the world, um, and they have the best gyro. So my dad was at the front, and he was, now I'm hungry. He he was at the front, (coughs) and uh, he was at the cash register, and two people walked in, two strangers walked in to order food. And my dad looked at these two men, and they were nicely dressed. Uh, They they looked put together. Uh, They looked good on the outside. He thought to himself, man, these are two customers any businessman would like to have. Any person owning a restaurant would love to have these types of customers. And so they come to the cash register. They order their food. They get their food, and they go, and they sit down, and they're enjoying their food. And then it happens. There's another man that walks in, and this guy, his hair is all messed up, uh, his, his beard is unkept, he's got tattoos everywhere. My dad looked at him and thought to himself, oh man, here comes a bum. And so the man approached the cash register and he ordered his food, and my dad thought to himself, I hope this guy doesn't stick around here all day. I'm going to have to get him out of here eventually. I'm sure he's just going to spend all day here 
and, and do nothing. And so the, the guy that looked like a bum got his food and went and he sat down and was eating. And so my dad was at the front uh, working and he was listening to the two gentlemen who's, uh, who looked really good on the outside. They had nice clothes, good appearance, and they were being really vulgar. They were uh, cussing up a storm. Uh, they were saying things that were really inappropriate. My dad didn't really think much of it because, hey, you know what? They looked good on the outside. And eventually, these two men left the restaurant with their food. And time went on and time went on and time went on. And guess who was still there? It was the guy with the, the messy hair, the unkept beard, and all the tattoos that looked homeless and a bum. And so my dad thought to himself after a little while, I got to go up there and see what's going on. He's been here for a long time. And so he gets behind the counter, he gets out from behind the counter, he goes into the dining area, he rounds the corner, and there's the man sitting there with his food, and he has a Bible open. And he's reading his Bible. And my dad, in that moment, felt so convicted. And it's a moment he'll never forget. He judged these, uh, these customers based on what he saw. And Grace family, how often do we do that? How often do we fall into that trap? Not just my dad, but all of us. Every single one of us is susceptible of judging people based on what we see instead of getting to know them and seeing their character firsthand. We have a tendency of playing favorites. And so here's James. He's warning his beloved congregation. He's telling them that while you're far from home, while you're far from heaven, don't play favorites. Don't show favoritism in the church. You know, I think too often we determine, we determine who's in and who's out, who the haves are and who the have-nots are. We determine who's welcomed and included, and we determine who's unwelcomed and excluded. We determine who's in our clique and who's not in our clique. And unfortunately, like James is talking about here, these decisions are made based on what we see. What a person has to offer. If the person is satisfying to us or if the person agrees with us on many different issues. We make these decisions and these judgments based on the coin maybe they have in their pocket. Grace family, I cannot stress this enough. Christianity is not a popularity contest. And when it becomes a popularity contest, we get it wrong and we go astray. I think about the Old Testament. The Israelites wanted a king. God was not good enough for them. God was their one true king, but they wanted to be just like every single other nation around them. And so they said, God, give us a king, a king that we could follow. And they ended up with a king who had a rich dad, and their king was very handsome on the outside, the text says. This king was strong on the outside. His shoulders were wider. He was taller than the rest, and this king's name was Saul. And he turned out to be a miserable king. You see, the problem, man looks at the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so here's James. He's a caring pastor. He loves his congregation. He tells them, don't show partiality. Don't play favorites as you hold to the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, the Lord of glory. He's saying that you can't hold the faith and play favorites at the same time. He's saying that genuine faith in Jesus, genuine faith in Jesus Christ, is incompatible with favoritism. Genuine faith cannot mix with favoritism. These two things can't go together. And so I asked my staff, give me some examples of things that are incompatible. One of them uh, said, eating Oreos and brushing your teeth. Um, uh, another one said, being friends with uh, Bears fans. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> another, an, another, another, one said, <laughs> another one said, pastors that moved to Ohio. And, and I'll just leave that one there. So, so, so we know things that are incompatible, right? Things that are incompatible that don't go together. And so the point is, is that faith in Jesus and favoritism, they don't go together. These things are opposites, and they're opposites because of who God is and what Jesus Christ's ministry looked like. 
You know, I think about God's character. We talked about this already in the beginning of the sermon. God is impartial. God does not play favorites, right? He cannot do this. It's sinful. And this is actually reflected in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that? The genealogy of Jesus. It encompasses all different types of people. You have nobility. You have kings like Solomon. You have common folk like Mary and Joseph. You got people with good reputations like Hezekiah, and you have people with not so much good reputation like the prostitute Rahab. All different types of people in the genealogy of Jesus. Why? Because God does not play favorites. He's impartial. And not only that, you think about the ministry of Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't just minister to people that looked a certain way on the outside. He ministered to all different types of people, didn't he? I think about the ethnic outcast. Jesus ministered to the Samaritan woman at the well. I think about how Jesus ministered to the moral outcast, the woman caught in adultery. Jesus even ministered to the sick, lepers, people who looked like they had no hope. Jesus also ministered to the powerful. I think about the Roman centurion. And he ministered to even the wealthy, even people who were crooked, like the tax collector. And so Jesus, you think about it, Jesus had every single right to play favorites. He had every single right to do what he wanted with the people he saw. He had every single right to take us at base value. He had every single right to be a click with his disciples. And yet, he was not. He brought good news to all people. He gave all people the hope of the gospel. He told all people to believe and repent and place your faith in him for salvation. This is the ministry of Jesus. And you and I, if you're saved, have been impacted by this ministry. We have seen the benefits of worshiping a God who is impartial and who does not play favorites. I mean, think about it. There's no reason why I should be saved. There's no reason why you should be saved. We're not the smartest. We're not the brightest. We're not the strongest. We're not the wisest. For many of us, you couldn't even pick us out of a crowd. And yet, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, because God is a God who doesn't play favorites. Now, if this is who God is, and this is what Jesus' ministry looked like, how dare we, as the church, play favorites? Favoritism prevents us from fulfilling the Great Commission, doesn't it? You know, if if, if the book of James is going to take root in our hearts, if what James is saying is going to take root in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit, then our church should begin to look differently on the outside because we're bringing the gospel to all different types of people. And this is especially true for where our church is located. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Within 10 20 minutes away from our church building, we have farms, we have suburbs, we have city, we have upper class, we have middle class, we have lower class, we have people who live in really big houses, we have people who live in really small houses, we have people who live in the trailer park, we have people who live really close to the mayor's office. Not only that, but we have people with all different kinds of backgrounds, all different types of ethnicities, all different types of skin color that we rub shoulders with every single day. These people are your next door neighbor. These people are the people you bump into at the grocery store. These people are the people your kids play baseball with. They're on your kids' baseball team. These are people that you work with every single day, your co-workers, and God has commissioned you. Jesus has commissioned us to go and make disciples, bring the gospel to them. And so if we are faithful with the gospel message, our church will begin to look different on the outside. And by the gospel continuing to transform us, we will be the same on the inside. We will share the same blood, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ. So James gives us an illustration to help us understand this. That's really timeless. James 2, 2 through 3. For if a man wearing a gold ring 
and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in. And if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Now, <clears throat> he's clearly talking about uh, not, uh, not showing favoritism to the rich. But I want us to be careful because it goes both ways, doesn't it? We can show favoritism towards the poor and also reject the wealthy simply because they're wealthy and we don't like them and we're jealous of them. And so this illustration could really go both ways. We could show favoritism towards different types of people. But for this specific illustration, he's talking about how they're showing favoritism towards the rich, most likely because that's what they're struggling with. And so this is basically what James says. Picture this. It's Sunday morning service. And your old pal, Pastor Nick, is standing at the front door. And the first impression team is at the welcome desk. And uh, we have an usher standing at the back of the sanctuary helping people find their seats. And there you are, Grace Bible Church, walking back and forth, talking and having a great time on Sunday morning. And then... It happens. We have a group of strangers that walk into our church. They've never been to our church before. The first people that walk into our church is a family. And this family is in their Sunday best. This family is put together nicely. Uh, the, this family looks really nice on the outside. Their husband is clean shaven. Their wife's hair is done very nicely. And they look really good. They're a great looking family. And then the second person comes in who's a stranger, completely different person. Their hair is unkept. Maybe their beard is unkept. Uh, maybe they're wearing dirty clothing. Maybe they're a little stinky, and they walk into our church. Uh, just like the family that's put together, they walk past uh, your old pal, Pastor Nick. They walk past the welcome desk. They walk, walk past the ushers, and they find a seat in this sanctuary maybe next to you. Now, I have a question. Who's more likely to receive a handshake on Sunday morning? Is it the family that's well put together, or is it the guy that looks homeless? Who's more likely to meet new people? Is it the family that's well put together, or is it the guy that's stinky and sitting by himself? I want you to think about this. Who's more likely to receive a lunch invitation? Is it the people that are well put together, or is it the person whose hair's all messed up and looks out of place? I want you to think about this. Who's, going, who's more likely to generate more excitement in the congregation? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It's not the unkept person. The unkept person might come into our congregation and all congregations and be unnoticed. Man, how sad is it to walk past the pastor, to walk past the welcome king, to walk past the usher, to walk past the entire congregation and go unnoticed. You see how deadly favoritism is, Grace? How deadly it can be. We need to be a type of church that no matter who you are, you are welcome to the front doors of this church. It does not matter who you are. It, every single person needs to be welcomed through the front doors of Grace Bible Church. It doesn't matter if you have tattoos. It doesn't matter if you have piercings on your face. It doesn't matter if you're gay. It doesn't matter if you're from a different religion, if you're Muslim. It doesn't matter what you believe or who you voted for. Every single person has to be welcomed to the front doors of Grace Bible Church because every single person is created in the image of God and their only hope is the gospel, is Jesus. And so if we're faithfully doing our job, if we're faithfully proclaiming Christ crucified in the community, our church will look differently on the outside. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Nick, Nick, whoa, 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 let's slow down a second. Aren't you concerned that if people like this start coming to our church, that we might become an unbiblical church? That we might start believing things that are heretical? Absolutely not. No, I'm not afraid of that happening because we are a come as you are church, but we are not a stay as you are church. We are a come as you are church, 
but we're not to stay as you are, church. Jesus is actively transforming this congregation. And he'll do it with other people, too, when they come in. We have to be faithful to the word of God, to scripture, to not be swayed by culture, to not be uh, twisted, and to not downplay what God's word says. We must be faithful. But Grace, within the context of the passage we're reading, this is the hard truth we got to swallow this morning. It's this. Uh, look at the screen. Favoritism is a barrier to the gospel. And woe to us if the unbelieving world has to jump over barriers of favoritism in order to hear Christ crucified. Favoritism is a barrier to the gospel. And so James says, while you're far from home, don't play favorites. Don't be a church that's cliquish. Don't be a church that determines the value of a person because of what you see. Don't play favorites. And so James, you got to love James. James, he, he, he cares about his people so much. He doesn't just say, don't do that. He says, this is why you don't do that. He explains the why so that the don't takes root in their hearts. He loves them. And so he explains the reason why favoritism is sinful. Point number two, the reason. The first reason that James gives us is that favoritism dethrones God. It attempts to dethrone God by making you and me the judge of someone else based on what we see, judging them at face value. Verse 4, James says, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil Thoughts And so favoritism attempts to dethrone God, and it attempts to replace us as the judge. And so favoritism is really mutiny against our true captain, Jesus Christ. But favoritism is high treason against our true king, God. Because we assume the throne, and we begin to, to determine this person has more value than this person. This person has less value than this person. This person is valuable. This person is not valuable. And we make these decisions based on what we see. We judge them at face value, what they have, what status they have. And it's very superficial and dangerous. Have you ever seen, <clears throat> have you ever seen the TV show uh, Pawn Stars? Anyone seen that before? Pawn Stars, or at least heard about it? Uh, it, it's a show about how a staff interacts with their customers. The customers come in, and they have all these uh, really cool artifacts and items, and they're trying to sell their stuff to the staff. And they bring in some crazy things. I mean, they bring in crazy-looking cars. They bring in things like comic books. I think the thing they sold the most on this show uh, was a, a, a three-piece suit that George Washington wore, and they sold it to the staff for over $2 million. $2 million. Now, I'm bringing this up to you because when our church or when any church shows favoritism, we turn our church into an episode of Pawn Stars, don't we? We determine, uh, you know, this person is more valuable. Look at what they're wearing. Uh, this person is not so much valuable. They're a little bit stinky. Uh, this person is a little bit more valuable. They like the same things I like, and we dismiss the other person. It becomes an episode of Pawn Stars, and that's not going to further the gospel. We need to remember God is the one who sits on the throne, isn't he? He's the one who determines our value. He is the one who uh, uh, determines who we are. And so this is what God says in his word in Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Favoritism attempts to distort the image of God. It distorts the image of God by devaluing the fact that someone was created in the image of God. Or the opposite is true. It distorts the image of God by elevating the image of God in someone to the point where we worship them. And that is dangerous as well. And so Psalm 139, 14, it also says, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Favoritism rejects that all people are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
Grace family, don't be a judge. God is the judge who sits on his throne. The second reason, the second reason uh, favoritism is a sin is because favoritism, James says, rejects those that God has chosen. Uh, verses 5 through 6, listen, my beloved brothers, has not, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. You know, Grace family, I think one of the greatest mysteries in the Bible that I just will never be able to wrap my head around this side of heaven is the doctrine of predestination. You know, I think about the Ephesians. The book of Ephesians tells us that before the foundation of the world, God chose us for salvation. I don't think on this side of heaven I'll ever be able to fully wrap my mind around that, to comprehend it, to grasp that doctrine. But I have come to find that that doctrine is like candy. Like candy, the surface of that doctrine, the outer shell of that doctrine is hard on the outside. It is hard to crack through it. But once we crack through it, we find that the inside is sweet like candy. And so God is saying, if you're saved, God has chosen you, and it's not because of favoritism. We're not the smartest. We're not the strongest. We're not the most famous. You could hardly pick us out of a crowd. And yet, God loved us when we were unlovable, when we were his enemies, and he saved us by grace alone. I don't think I'll be able to grasp that on this side of heaven, but boy, is this doctrine sweet like candy on the inside. God has chosen, James said, those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith. And not only the poor, not only the poor, but also those who are wealthy as well. We as Christians who live in America are considered to be more wealthy Christians compared to the rest of the world. But remember what the Apostle Paul said. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Paul said this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So Grace family, not only are we not supposed to play favorites with those who are strangers in our congregation, but we need to be careful not to play favorites with those who are brothers and sisters within our own congregation. How easy is it for us as a church to just circle up into our own little cliques and to forget about the brother and sister in the faith, to forget about people who are different than us, maybe on the outside, or people that we judge on the outside. How painful is that when we do that to the bride of Jesus Christ? Think about this. If you were to come up to me, and say, Nick, I'm going to reject your wife because of what she looks like. I don't like your wife because of what I see on the outside. Well, let me just be straight with you. You and I would not be homies, okay? <laughs> we would not be cool if that's what you, if you came up to me and said that. My, I think my wife is beautiful. But how painful is it? How painful is it when we do this to the bride of Christ? When we say, God, I know this is your bride, I know these are brothers and sisters in Christ, but I just dismiss them and devalue them and forget that they're fearfully and wonderfully made. Third reason why it's sinful, James says, because favoritism worships man. He goes on in verses 6 through 7, he says, but you have dishonored the poor man. <clears throat> are not the rich the ones who oppress you, the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And so James is saying, why do you consider the rich to be more valuable than you? Why do you worship them? These are the people who are persecuting you. Why are you putting them on a pedestal? 
They're sinful, just like you. Favoritism worships man. And so we have to understand, if we are a church that rolls out the red carpet for only the rich and not the poor, then we're a church that's not a servant of the living God. Instead, we're a church that's a slave to sinful man. Now, Grace, I know that's a mouthful. I know James has just said a lot. But let me remind you, at the beginning of the sermon, we said, if you can't say amen, say ouch, right? This is, there's a lot going on here. And none of it makes a difference unless we actually apply it. What does this look like when the rubber meets the road? That's my third point, application. Let me briefly go through this. I, I am a firm believer that the opposite of favoritism is hospitality. Favoritism rejects the stranger. Hospitality loves the stranger. Favoritism rejects the stranger. Hospitality loves the stranger. And so the question is, how can our church create a culture that rejects favoritism and embraces hospitality? Grace family, I want to be upfront. Hospitality is not just for the extrovert. It's also for the introvert. Hospitality is not just for the wife. It's also for the husband. Hosp uh, hospitality is not just for the first impression team. It is also for every single church or every single Christian within the congregation. It is the responsibility of our church to love the stranger who walks in to our door. Here's a couple of different ways we can do that, some practical ways. Number one, it starts with our mind. We need to remember we need to remember that all people are fearfully and wonderfully made, especially the people that drive us up the wall, especially the people on Facebook right now that are throwing down with each other. We got to remember that all people are fearfully and wonderfully made, even if they're a little stinky, even, the, even if we don't like what they look like, even if we don't approve of their clothing, all people are fearfully and wonderfully made. Here's the second thing you can do. Introduce yourself to someone new at church. Introduce yourself to someone new. Don't wait for someone to come to you. If you see someone new, go up to them and be like, hey, how long have you been coming to Grace? Uh, where are you from? Uh, what's your names? Get, get to know each other. Introduce yourself to someone new. There are people here who have attended our church for years, and I'm sure many of us don't know who they are. Find them and introduce yourself to them. But don't just stop there. And be an inviter. Invite someone over for dinner. Invite someone over to your house for lunch. Invite someone uh, to get a cup of coffee with. Someone you normally wouldn't hang out with or spend time with. Get to know people who are different than you. Maybe who have different beliefs than you so that you can share the gospel with them and get to know them. And not only that, let's take it a step further. Diversify your friend group. Diversify your friend group. Is your friend group people that only agree with you, people who look like you, people who talk like you and dress like you? If so, chances are you're not doing a good job fulfilling the Great Commission. Diversify your friend group. Get to know the unbeliever that lives next door. Invite them over to your house. Invite someone new over from our church that you've never talked to before. Be intentional of getting to know people. Diversify your friend group. Here's another one that I think is really important right now in our church. A foster a relationship with a different generation. God has blessed our church. I mean, look around. We have people of all different generations in this church. It's amazing. God is doing that. We have older members who have been married for 50 years. We have newer members who have been married for a year and a half. We have people who have had kids for 25 years. We have people who have had kids for five months. Foster a relationship with a different generation. If you're an older member of our church, get to know some of the uh, younger members of our church. Get to know who they are, what they're struggling with. Care for them. Help them in their parenting. Be an encouragement. Pour into them. Disciple them. If you're a younger member of this church, care for the older members of our church. There are, some, there are some older members that need help. 
Go and spend time with them. Sit with them. Love them. And even if they don't need help, do life with them. Care for them. Hear stories about their lives and learn and grow from each other. God will sanctify our church in this way. And so we got to foster, foster a relationship with the next generation. Here's the last one. Show hospitality even to the point of sacrifice. Even to the point of sacrifice. It is hard to go against our flesh. In our flesh, we want to play favorites. We want to uh, show partiality. We want to have favorites and hold on to the faith at the same time. But we cannot. And so it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we show hospitality even to the point of sacrifice. In what way do you need a sacrifice for the stranger? Have you ever thought about that before? In what way do you need to show, make a sacrifice for the stranger who walks past you every single day? I don't know who that is, but I am sure God is placing that person on your mind and on your heart now, and that is not a coincidence. Show hospitality towards them. I want to end uh, by talking about this uh, pretty cool pastor that I came across um, this, this past week. His name is Francis Grimke. Um, he, he died a long time ago, by the way. <clears throat> um, but in the year 1898, 1898, Francis Grimke, uh, he, he was pastoring his church, and he called his church to repent because of their hypocrisy. They had fallen into the trap of showing favorites and rejecting people who were in need. And so this guy thundered against his congregation boldly because their, his church had lost her way. And this is what he said. I think it's so powerful. He said, the pulpit should be a tower of strength to every weak cause. Women should hasten to the church saying, our cause will be upheld there. Homeless little children should speed to the sanctuary, saying, we will be welcomed there. Slaves running away should open the door, church door with certainty of hospitality. Grace family favoritism rejects helping those who are in need. But there's good news. For the Christian, favoritism died on the cross of Jesus Christ. And let favoritism remain dead and let Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, reign over his church. And let us be a church that shows hospitality towards the stranger. Let's pray.